Let's hear it for the boys. Let's give those boys a hand right here on Let's Hear It For The Boys. I'm Alex. I'm Justin. I'm Pete. And we are going to be talking about The Boys Season 4, Episode 5, Beware the Jab to Walk Me, Son. You got to say it like that. Ooh, do you? So, nice. Yeah, I don't know sure. if you do. Eh, I don't know. That was sure like kind of a butcher voice. It's pretty bad. No, I, I'm sorry to tell you that was not kind of anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, if you haven't watched it on Prime Video, please do go watch it. We're going to spoil it. But three things are happening. We got a classic A plot, B plot, C plot structure going on here. Oh, Love yeah. It. That's the first Love thing that. I thought when I saw this. <laughs> My episode. favorite part. Uh huh. Uh, well, no, I, I did think that was interesting. Watch too much usually, TV. Usually we see like things crash together, but here we got three trains running. We're focusing on the V52 Expo, which is run by Vought, as well as all the hilarious backstage shenanigans that are going uh, on there. Uh, so good. Yes. Uh, meanwhile, we've got Huey is dealing with some shenanigans of his own. Basically, his reanimated dad who is murdering people and going insane because he suffered brain death. And then they gave him Compound V. And then the third trade we got is everybody else wandering around a farm and being attacked by farm animals in pursuit of the virus in a big, what is this, a crossover episode? Sure is with Jen V. Lots ah. of stuff going down here uh, involving we get to see Kate and Sam yeah. from Gen V. Yeah. We also get a little bit of a pickup of the Adam Bork being a s- s- serial sexual abuser storyline. Very fun for everybody. Everybody loves that one. Uh, and, mm. But the biggest one is the virus. If you didn't watch Gen V, we get a big chunk of a recap previously on Gen V in this episode. Yeah. Uh, we also get I, some clarification. Correct me if I'm wrong here. This is my supposition about the timeline, right? Okay, there you go. <laughs> I guess I won't say anything else. Uh, here's This has been a question going into here is like, how do Gen V and the boys fit together? And I think based on this episode, what we're getting is the large majority of Gen V takes place before the boys season four. All that stuff has happened yes. leading into this. The one thing that did not happen yet is the end credit scene from Gen V where Butcher investigated the woods and found out about the virus and all the wreckage there because we do get that scene of Butcher and Joe sharing information and being like, we got to check this out on our own. And then immediately after that, Butcher's like, I know about this virus. And I think it's Mother Smokes is like, why didn't you tell us about this before? What's going on? Yeah. And the reason is he didn't know about it before. He just found out about it in the middle of this episode. Does that sound right? Or am I totally off base there? Sure. I think that's right. When you say Joe, do you mean Negan? Of course. Yes. Okay, yeah. great. It's don't mm-hmm. use the Joe because you lost I mean it. John Winchester from Supernatural, Pete? Oh, uh, that's the nope. best way to refer to it. Nope. Um, I- I have. Uh, I was just talking with uh, with a friend, a friend of the podcast, John Gabris, who um, is caught. Shout out this. to Gabris. Shout out to Gabris. He um, he was talking about. He has a great theory about um, about the Negan, the Joe character, mm-hmm. that we we have we've seen uh, Butcher's wife as part of this sort of uh, fantasy that he's having, sort of a image, and then we know there's something in his brain. We see him with the rabbit this episode that feels like parasite happening here. What if the Negan character, Joe, is also a hallucination? Oh, shit. Because no one else has interacted with him yet. Mm-hmm. I and could see could Negan be... being his little devil on the shoulder. You know what I mean? Yeah, like the Becca parasite is the pushing angel. Him. He's the devil. Do you think they're going to dress them like that, if that's true? Like, Becca is a little angel on his shoulder. Negan in, like, a little cartoon Donald Duck devil costume. <laughs> have to how else could we get the metaphor unless they dress like it and we're <laughs> tiny versions of themselves standing on his shoulder blades. this is what i'm saying go like wah, 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 wah. that was uh donald duck yeah. by the way oh please stop and let me say perfect <laughs> no thank you. Perfect thank, thank you thank you jesus thank you suffering oh. succotash says donald duck i believe <laughs> oh boy Wow. Anyway, uh, yeah, good theory. I've definitely seen that one bouncing around a lot online, particularly to jump all the way to the end of the episode with Samir, the great uh, Omar Abtahi. That's his name, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Who is awesome. I love him and everything. He was a Salim on American Gods. He was on oh, Gods yeah. And a bunch of other things. Uh, he's awesome. It was always fun, very fun to see him pop up. But I saw somebody pointing out at the end of the episode after Joe and Butcher have cut off his leg and captured him. Negan and Butcher. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
that Samir looks very confused yeah. and is looking over where Butch is looking and being like, huh? So fair theory, I think, potentially. I mean, yeah. somebody we'll see. Know, cuts off your leg, you'd probably be a little confused about what's happening. Yeah, but I, I do think this emphasizes uh, what I guess we'll call the Gabrus theory. Coming yeah, the way Gabrus theory. Referring to it, yeah. <laughs> There's a couple other of those floating around the internet that you might not want to check out. Uh-oh, don't, don't Google that one, folks. Let's talk about the whole episode, though. Uh, again, because we got these three sections, I think we could talk about them individually. Since we're already talking about the Joe Butcher, Sabir whole thing, let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, I, I got to say, and I know Pete's going to yell at me, I didn't love this storyline. And part of the really? reason that I didn't love this storyline, there's two big reasons. One, th- this is the more minor one. Structurally, it felt like an excuse to have everybody have these one-on-one conversations that we didn't necessarily need as they walked around a farm and being like, let's take a break here so you can talk to this character and lay out this information about how you're feeling emotionally. And usually the show is so good about just very explicitly implying it, but clearly implying what people are feeling. Things like Fre- are you- everybody being like, hey, Frenchie, you're okay. And him snorting Coco K to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. That tells me so much more about Frenchie than Frenchie stopping and talking to Addy and him holding the rosary beads and being like, I believe in God, but I'm dabbed. It's very much yeah. speaking your emotions. So wait, wait, wait. You're yes. saying that when you're on a, a giant walk with friends and family, maybe walking to your death, a, a farm death, of course, uh, that death. you don't stop at certain points just to kind of check in with somebody and just kind of be like, hey, I know there's this huge, more important thing going on, but I just wanted to check in with you and see how you're doing. While yeah, there's rest. killer farm animals and chickens flying through people. So let's yeah. take a little chill out section. So here. you don't do that? I guess not. I don't know. Oh, weird. Have you ever, it, ever been in a horror story and just thought like, hey, we should just they stop They do that here. in most Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies, right? They're being yep. chased by Leatherface and like, quick break. How quick are you break. Feeling? Yeah, they Check call it. a timeout. We got to do you, a little. Uh... Yeah, you call a timeout and they can't <laughs> They can't murder you. Yeah. Oh, put down while you're chains. monologuing. Yeah. Is that why you added farm death to my calendar, Pete? Is that what that <laughs> I did. Is? You noticed. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I had some questions. I put a question mark, but I'm excited. We're going to walk around and some of us will die. Sick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to stay away from the uh, yeah, person There is in the well. another bigger thing I want to talk about, but let's – yeah, go ahead, Justin. Well, I was just going to say, like, I, I agree with you, Alex, that it, it felt a little writerly, this whole segment, yeah. where, like, they were – it was just a little convenient. And also, the, the show is best when it's just going at 100 miles an hour. And this was the section of the show that was being very coy, where it's like, yes, yeah, Starlight is not doing well. Frenchie needs to talk to Kamiko and Kamiko needs to talk to Frenchie. And it's sort of like they're just sort of sort of letting that slowly cook and it just doesn't work because it's not what the show is. And if you notice it so much more because everything else is moving so quickly and so well, I feel like. Yeah, the bigger thing with this storyline is it was driving me a little nuts it fe- the, with the virus plot. Because that felt 100% like spinning its wheels. Just to lay out the plot of what happens with the virus here, the entirety of season one of Gen V was, we're building up this virus, the bad guys are building up the virus, but it's complicated because they want to create a virus strong enough to kill Homelander. Victoria Newman takes the virus, brings it to her secret lab. By the time we catch up into this episode, it's like, oops, we've lost the virus. We only have one sample of the virus okay, get rid of that so that we could save ourselves from these sheep. And the place we are at the end of the episode is they captured Samir so he can create a virus that's strong enough to kill Homelander, which is the exact same place that we were in for eight episodes of Gen V. And I understand you've got this thing hanging over the show, right? If you have a soup-killing virus, that is a thing that's like a deus ex machina that's hanging over the entire thing that couldn't be pulled out at any point. But I feel like you got to make a decision there. Either like, oops, virus is gone. We're done. We can't have that anymore. So that isn't the thing we can pull out. Or alternately, it gets loose and something else happens and we move forward in the story. I think it, I think it kind of, I understand your frustration for sure. But I also feel that like, 
the that idea is backsliding as well as butcher is backsliding you know what i mean we're like you know he's good he's bad we can't trust him we can trust him he's supposed to be good he's not now he's having imaginary uh evil uh negans appear and so i just think it's one of those things where like i i understand like why do we go through this whole thing but at the same time um you know, this team is very self-sabotaging, you know, and it's a thing that they do very well, also very maddening. And I just think that, like, having it, Negan's struggle kind of parallel this, I I thought it was kind of an interesting choice. So I didn't I didn't get as angry or um, kind of... Uh, you know, as angry. Steaming yeah. mad. Yeah, yeah. Just medium-flavored angry. Because I, I, I feel like that... these two things are in this what butcher's dealing with so like mm -hmm. having this slide with butcher's slide kind of like okay let's just put that two madnesses together and we'll kind of deal with that later well and like i do think the maybe a larger theme of this season is getting into newman wants like full superhero acceptance right homelander wants full superhero soup dominance and the virus is full soup elimination so mm -hmm. like it's uh it's such everyone has their own position but they haven't really crystallized that and it just feels a little slapdash the way newman's there in this episode and it, it it just felt a little messy and sort of like why are all these pieces doing this now when i feel like that's what's going to be happening at the end of the season what we're building toward and the stan edgar of it all too is sort of like why did he why was he there because he doesn't doesn't do much he's there to get newman there in a reasonable way i guess but it just felt like i love seeing giancarlo esposito mm -hmm. but it just yeah, felt I mean, sort of on. strange it was a weird just had a weird like dream energy of like why are yeah. all these people I, I was gonna say that as well is again on the writerliness of this section this felt like a way of potentially if the thing we think happened at the end happened which is that newman probably blew his head up there's a strong implication of that in the final scene maybe it went the other way we'll see which way it goes but it felt like a way of like let's bring him back to wrap up his story so he's not this thing hanging out but that's not the way he's operated at any other part of this show he's always been the guy in total control and the implication here when they pick him up in jail is he still has that he still has his fingers yeah. and everything he's still in control of everything this just felt like a way to be like let's have fun one more time with giancarlo esposito and we did i like you said enjoyed seeing him his lines were funny yeah his rapport with claudia dumid who plays victorian Moomin, is great um but it was a little bit of a waste of the character oh how dare you you can't just say it was great to see him and then just say it was a waste. That's completely contradicts it. Pete, it if nice you come to, to a him... party and then you hang out in the corner checking your phone all the time, that's a waste of seeing you. Okay. Because exactly. Oh, that that you can better not what we do it on yeah. Farm Death. Farm Death better be more than that. <laughs> <laughs> farm Death Day, you they actually take your phones outside the farm uh, before yeah. Farm Death begins. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Full focus on farm death and no filming. There's no yeah, filming. Yeah, that way you death. can't Google like how to stop flying evil sheep. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you got to figure it out. Yeah. It's like an escape room, but you don't with no phones. Yeah. Escape yeah, room. we got sidetracked here, but I just think that. Did we? Um, <laughs> I just think that <laughs> the, for me, the frustration with this um, uh, show or episode is the fact that like this team that can never seem to work together if they could just communicate would really be so much better and so much easier to watch in a less frustrating way mm -hmm. That's I, I mean, everybody's, baby. everybody's pointing that out this season we've had multiple jokes about how have you guys stayed alive what are you doing victoria yeah. newman walks into that lab and immediately is like they all start nose bleeding because she's going to blow up their heads. They are so overpowered and out of their depth. But I do think the one plot point that I really did like here, MM is very much getting lost this season. I think he's moving to the background of the leadership role. But him stepping up and laying it out for everybody. Oh, uh, like, that was oh, great. The way he this... just kind of was like, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, just yeah. awesome. Well, that's... that's why he is the right leader for this group that is why he is the man with the plan and in charge is because he can keep a level head in this situation even though he's getting hives off of it at the same time but that works for me that is character progression and he didn't need to stop at any point and be like 
I am having frustrations about this thing so much as they did it yeah. at the point that they did it and they moved forward to the action. Also, that was such a funny thing to reveal. Like, look, hives, I am really stressed. You know, like, yeah. okay, like there are flying killer sheep here, bro. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do we fun. think? What do we think about Starlight? Because we've we've seen her sort of have a rough beginning of the season, and her powers are also on the fritz at the mm-hmm. same time. Newman calls it out. Are we building toward, because I think, not to jump uh, rails, but like they've sort of paired in this episode that Starlight's losing it and Homelander's losing it. Mm-hmm. Like, what are we getting at with with her sort of falling off? I mean, off? I'm more worried about her relationship with Huey than I am with, you know, the other things going on because they're not, haven't been there for each other in a nah, while. They're and good. I think the whole they're point is out. they are good. They don't need right. to check in with each other all the time. That's not a problem. That's not an issue this season. Oh, okay, do... so if your family, and you know, I hope this doesn't happen to you, but if you have a family member uh, die and your partner's nowhere to be seen at all, you think that's cool? That's just, hey, I, I know cool. they're there for me and I didn't... Uh... Yes. Well, if depends, you're dealing if with end of the world stakes, like if my wife is trying to prevent the end of the world, I'm not going to be like, how dare you? I'm going to say, please go take care of that. I will take care of this other thing. Depends on if it's I farm would like that conversation. Farm death, sure. if, if, my, if my partner's at farm death, I'm not going to be mad. Yeah. That's important. At the yeah, very you got to know they're dealing with farm or, death. Uh, or sorry, yeah. not bring me back a t-shirt. At least put in an order for the t-shirt so it gets mailed to me after the farm death. Yeah, Wait, you want good. a farm death t-shirt? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I my wife did. went to farm death and all I got was this stupid t-shirt. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's perfect. Yeah, Pretty and then on the back, job. it'll be like, I love you and miss you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, yeah, all you need, like a back. little, you can't send a text or nothing. I mean, come on. No, I sent a t-shirt. That's nicer. That's a more primitive reminder than a text that's going to be lost in all like my text from Domino's and Papa John's and other things that change. <laughs> oh, yeah, you get a lot of texts from the pizza well, chains of the yeah. world. I don't Wait. even do texts. I just do t-shirts. Can we it's talk about the killer animals for a second? Because there's a Easter eggy kind of thing that I wanted to mention and then I wanted to throw something out at you guys. So the Easter eggy thing, very funny joke when Frenchie sees the flying chicken and says, Mom, oh. I can't believe this is fucking happening to me again. <laughs> but yeah. if people don't remember, that did happen to him before season three, episode four, Glorious Five Year Plan. When they were searching for Soldier Boy, they found they had tested a hamster who, wait, I wrote down the name, uh, Jamie oh, the yeah. Hamster. Uh, who was flying around and ultimately saved Frenchie by flying through it and eating a soldier's eyeball. Yeah. So yeah. great joke, but also I was like, oh, that's really good continuity at the same time. So very good. But that reminds me of the one of the best jokes I've watched on television all year long. It's when they're trying to figure out what to do about the sheep and they're like, let's let's uh, get this, throw his throw him out there so that mm-hmm. he can uh, spread the virus to the sheep. And he's, Frenchie goes, this man is in no condition to fuck a sheep. Fuck sheep. Yeah. <laughs> man, that killed me. That made me laugh so fucking hard. I loved it. Such a good show. Uh, so that was great. The thing that I wanted to throw out at you guys, and I, I don't know if I necessarily agree to this, but I was like, good tweet, was somebody put up a clip of the flying sheep tearing the bull apart and were like, this is like a mid-level episode of Doom Patrol. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, like, truth. Yes. <laughs> Which really emphasized to me, again, very funny. Always, I can't be too mad about chickens flying around and killing people with eggs and flying through a guy and whatever. Yeah. All fun stuff. But it absolutely felt like, hey, what would be funny killer farm animals and that's kind of where the thought process ended there wasn't much extension here in terms of this other than the funny visual go off well, yourself I, let's have some fun every once in a while come on man i agree with you and especially given the other two sides of the show one was also fun but with some larger big moves the the mm-hmm. homelander uh, uh vaught stuff and then the huey hugh stuff was like not fun was not fun, was like no. super emotional and also really well done. So I do think the balance of this being goofy at the end, I thought did work. Yeah, that, that, okay. they needed that. Cool. They needed that. Yeah, because well, we had to watch about, Simon Pegg die and that was rough, man. Well, let's talk about the Huey, Huey Sr. stuff uh, because, yeah, that's that's definitely the hardest storyline to watch. It's been very interesting to me to see the reaction 
to that one because there's a lot of people that felt like that storyline went too far. They felt like they're just going into torture for Huey and that's all they're doing on the show. I disagree with that personally. This storyline, again, hard to watch, upsetting, but really worked for me because they really dove down in a very explicit way, but metaphorically, what was going on with Huey Sr., what Huey needs to do as a character, what he needs to move past. It shows what he's learned over the course of the show and over the course of the season as well, in terms of letting go. And the whole idea of what if you had a chance to say the thing to your parent before they go? Uh, yeah. That got me. Oh, man. Well, it also, it felt like, it was like an Alzheimer's metaphor, like a super mm. violent, dark version of like what it sort of maybe feels like to to go through that with a parent. And I thought it was really well done, super violent and dark, uh, but it, it was a nice send off. And truly in a show filled with death, the way that, that Hugh, Simon Pegg's character, like went at the end was like upsetting, touching, and just really delicately handled. And the fact that this show can sort of modulate those two things just across the series, but also jump from a scene where a bunch of people are dying from a farm animal mm -hmm. to this and nail this emotional side of it, I thought was just the, the way the release of the hand, it was just shot really smartly and balanced really well. So yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I, I think it was, it, was, it was brutal and messed up, but it was also this thing of like, you know, you're the father saying like, oh, Huey, you can't, you don't have the guts to be able to do the right thing. You know what I mean? You hold on too long, you know, and that really played out in such a way. And he got to kind of prove that, no, I can do the right thing. I am capable of, you know, whatever. But I just think that the more fucked up part for me where I couldn't kind of enjoy this okay, he's got a real chance to say goodbye this time, was the mom of it all, who we don't know what really happened with his relationship. And then she's doing secret evil moves on the side, like picking his pocket, injecting the V, doing all these kinds of stuff, and was like really playing Huey in a way that I couldn't tell. I was like, is this, are they going to be good after this? Is she just... Uh, have her own kind of like vaught agenda like you know what what are what well, are they gonna can be? i can i throw something out there because i do think i'm certainly getting a little bit of what you're saying and certainly yeah. there could be a turn there where it's like ooh, she's evil and there's a big twist but i think that's just rosemary dewitt the actress is very stoic and i think everything that we've been told up till the point is not her manipulating stuff she's been straight up about everything and she has explained Exactly. It didn't fall out of his pocket, bro. Well, it didn't that's, fall out of his pocket. That's the only thing I, I agree, because I do think it feels like it's pretty straight, but the section, the segment where she's like, it, it fell out of your pocket, so I just injected it in him. I was like, that's a weird move. And I yeah. think it, it gives me pause, and I do wonder what we're going, we're going for. Sure. There. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, there could be a turn somewhere, but again, just like looking on the front of the episode, I do think... She has been very upfront with Huey about everything that she went through in terms of postpartum depression. It seems yeah. like she really does want to be there for him and be the parent for him. Um, I know you don't trust her. That's okay. But I, again, I think like everything we're being told and the way that she's playing it otherwise, other than that very weird moment that it feels like they maybe cut a shot, frankly. Like there's a couple of things mm -hmm. throughout this season that feel like, huh, there is a scene missing there. We skipped something. So maybe it's nefarious, maybe it's not, but I tend to trust they are telling us what they're telling us, particularly because of the way that it pans out by the end of the episode. And it's it could be just a good mystery. I, I think the boys does this a lot where it sets a character up in the middle and then they choose. Mm -hmm. And it may be that it's like she chooses to be there for Huey. I want to uh, say two other things about this section. Like Huey's superpower is intense honesty, and we get to see that here in a great way. Like he's the one character on the show, he's the like moral center, and is able to just continually deliver that. He's sort of like I think he and Ryan are going to be on interesting uh, parallels this season. Um, so th I love that. And the other thing I was going to say is the whole Jar Jar thing. Huge yeah. missed opportunity. A great, very funny to reference the cat named Jar Jar. 
And at the end, he's like, I don't want to be Jar Jar. And I have a huge missed opportunity to not say, Misa don't want to be Jar Jar. No, come on, dude. <laughs> no, no. I really no, wanted that. Dude, I really no, wanted no, that joke. No, no, that's, that's yeah. a good joke. No, no, that's no. a good joke. I, oh, I will no. say once no, again, and we've talked about this before, but every single detail they throw out there about Simon Pegg's character is so specific and so good. Yeah. Him so... wanting a diet Snapple, I thought was great. I know. Him yeah, talk... he's... The du dual joke of him being like, ah, we should go to Paris. I'd love to go to Paris. Why does he want to go to Paris for the Da Vinci? The Da Vinci Code Vinci tours have got to be through the but roof But it's not. Right now. And the final reveal that his last words are like, it's not even the Da Vinci Code book tour. He wants to go on the movie the tour. Movie. Tom the Hanks. Movie yeah. Tour. <laughs> Tom, so Tom nice. Hanks is his last words. So funny. Man. I also will Mine throw too. out there, and I'm Mine sure. <laughs> Wait, you much know it. your last words already? Yeah, you just got to say them at the right time. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm, I wrote it on my hand for farm death. <laughs> Might it be Tom Hanks because that shortens to you. Thanks. Ooh. <laughs> Who, who's shortening it? What are you talking about? I don't know. For your tombstone? Yeah, for my tombstone. T. Hanks. Uh, anyway, uh, wait, what was the other thing I wanted to mention? Oh, I'm sure everybody who has read the comic or just generally has a knowledge of the world picked up on this. But the moment that I thought was so great that they got to it right before the end was Simon Pegg calling Jack Quaid Wee Huey. Wee Huey is what the character was called in yeah. the boys' comic book. It is yeah. physically based on Simon Pegg. So that was very much me being like Leonardo DiCaprio got pointing it. at the screen yeah. at the time. Yeah. But good, they got there. Uh, and just in terms of the powers you mentioned, Jack Well, Quaid. wait, we should, before we move on, we should just say, though, you can't book a Da Vinci Code movie tour right now because it is all sold out because of this episode. Oh, There's really? No question. Okay. There's no question. And you tried. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how wouldn't you after watching this being like, I got to check out this tour. It's the guy's dying wish. It's got to be you trying to live out Simon Pegg's death dream. Yeah, That's exactly, fun. man. <laughs> yeah. L -I -B -I -A, they man, actually killed on. him, which is pretty fucked up. Yeah. The, uh, his line where he basically explains his power, I thought was very nicely done, where he yells at Rosemary DeWitt and says, I did everything for you, and you looked through me like I wasn't even there. Oh, and then he fritzes. Yeah. And I was Dude. like, Oh, my God. Great. You nailed what these powers should be, and then the fact that he's ripping out people's hearts. It just was this amazing emotional texture, too, of Huey Sr. being the most pleasant, middle-of-the-road, normal man of the world. But really, there's this boiling rage that's been un underneath him that he's suppressed his entire life. And that's what the Compound V brings out in his dying moments. So I, I thought a really well-done storyline, but upsetting. Yeah. Let's turn to V52, a.k.a. Easter Egg Palooza. So much stuff going yeah. on here. So fun. As Cameron Coleman and the D presented an exhausting look. I, I believe that's the word they use into phases, what was it, the 7 phase. through 19? 7 through 19, yep. <laughs> of the VCU. There was Shots so fired. much work, work that they put in there. I'm not going to read through everything, but like starting from the intro reel that just went through the whole history of Vought, um, I didn't catch every single reference, but the best one was Big Chief Apache says, don't lead her Kiwasabi, which was a clear parody of the famous Crying Indian ad from 1970. Yeah. I love the fact that down to, it's a white guy. It's a white that. dude, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. This <laughs> whole ridiculous. area of the show was such just a stack of banger jokes. It was just yeah. killer. The Deep was so good in this episode. They continued to just <laughs> make him... So embarrassing and perfect. His line, um, Noah Bombach just pulled me from his latest slice of life drama. So <laughs> fucking funny. All the like race commentary on um, like black at it, putting the like the different drinks in Diebel's head. Oh my oh God. My Wait, God. can we talk about that for a second? Because Onions. that was like, that was, I mean, like you're saying, just in terms of the race commentary, having that whole section where they're talking about diversity a train is standing there, gets no lines, and the two white dudes are the ones that are saying everything. Perfect. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is <laughs> this so hurts good. in my oh, heart, awful. and yeah. it's great. But yeah, the drink thing, two things going on there. First of all, switching over to the cognac, cutting to A train, locking eyes with Sage, and then cutting to the two black people in the audience being like sitting there silently. <laughs> just, just, yeah. Again, absolutely on point and awful. But also, I just thought it was wild again and sort of like the luck of this show that i think it was three months ago that thing about cerveza cristal 
came out. Did yeah. you guys hear that? Yeah, yeah. There was this whole thing. It was actually back in like 2003. They had, I believe it was a Brazilian version of Star Wars was re-edited so that they were holding Cerveza Cristal, a beer in certain scenes. That's nothing they could have known was going to suddenly become a whole international news story three months ago when they filmed this a year ago. But like perfect timing there. That was great. Yeah, really good. Uh, and then all the stuff. The they Will show Ferrell off the whole... stuff was just so funny mm -hmm. too. Like that whole like coach, the white coach who, yeah, just. That was great. The tech night talking about we're it's time for a reboot one year after we did it. We're going to do the tech night. It has all of your favorite Nirvana hits and a 12 minute entirely black sequence. <laughs> That yeah. was very funny. Uh, but I'd also want to mention just they put up the MCU timeline of phases seven through 10. And again, I won't read through all of these, but according to Eric Kripke, the showrunner, they spent time on every single one of these logos and titles being like, does this make sense as a movie? What is this movie? Why are we putting it in here? How does it follow from the other one? And it's wild. Like it is it's, so... Yeah dense with Ted jokes, but like there's a firecracker movie every phase. There's a Homelander movie. <laughs> Everyone has like the seven reborn, the seven return, the seven forever. Um, I don't remember what the seven one is in the other one. Uh, there's right at the end in phase 10, there's speed walkers to ball race. They have <laughs> a train into the multiverse. Um, and there's oh and then there's in each one there's a g-men thing g-men are the world's parody of x-men and all the logos are taken directly from x-men logos where there's like g2 g-men g3 g-men and then g-men days past from the future so great just everything is great absolutely solid yeah uh but so much else going on oh, of the easter eggs in the storyline yes the A train saying it was the most expensive reshoot, so you know it's got to be good. It's just so <laughs> yeah. funny. Uh, that was great. Um, little sidestep before we get to some of like the big plot points. We also, like mentioned earlier, get to see Kate and Sam from Gen V. I thought their appearance here was weird. It was weird because it was sort of a half appearance. And then you see them like, I'll do anything for you, Homelander, basically. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted it to be either more or less. It felt like a weird middle that uh, didn't quite, I agree with it, didn't quite work. But I love that Gen V is part of this show in mm -hmm. general. Yes, totally agree Great. with that. Um, the Let's talk about the Homelander thing. And Ryan, you had mentioned him earlier, Justin. So the plot line here is that Adam Bork is pitching him on Super School. Ryan doesn't want to do that. Homelander allows him to not do it because he's dealing with... And I thought this was very interesting. He seems to, not surprisingly for a human being, but surprisingly for Homelander, dealing with PTSD from what he did last episode of project odessa and i thought this was a very interesting way of being like he is human despite his best efforts he thought that would clear out his guilt and free him to be the person he wants to be it doesn't at all and i thought that was a fascinating thing to watch him play throughout the episode well and even beyond that it felt like it taught him because he's been trying to reach ryan for yeah. the last you know season and a half and he, it, I think it taught him like, okay, me doing it my, the way I am is not working. And we see in this episode that he finally treats Ryan like he was treated. Like he, he just manipulates him rather than says, go do whatever, go, go kill whatever you, we can do this. We can do this. And Ryan resists. And then he listens to Ryan. Ryan says, I want to be a hero. And he takes that thing Ryan wants and twists it and we see it happen at the end and i thought this was so nefarious and well done and makes for a much sort of scarier scarier home yeah that's what i was gonna say someone who is in control and a ryan that is you see him become homelander in that moment whether it's permanent we don't know but in that moment i was like oh, oh no. fuck yeah yeah because you you were supposed to be the good you know the the hope that we had that maybe you know because that's homelander's only weakness at this point and if they team up we're all in trouble mm -hmm. yeah oh, in the real world yeah they're gonna we have to deal with farm death we might have to deal with like street death or something yeah exactly yeah. Homelander. Yeah, when farm death comes home. <laughs> <laughs> farm death to table death is what I like to say. Oh, man. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I thought this thing was so great as well. All the stuff with Adam Bork being so pathetic. And also another Gen V storyline picked up on. If you didn't watch Gen V, it was revealed that he exposed himself to Mika Kelly. And so was put yeah. in director jail, ended up having to teach at the school. Here we find out it's kind of even worse. He's like, I jerked it in front of Megan Kelly, but that was crossed wires. And first of all, I hope somebody talked to Megan Kelly to be like, hey, just so you know, this is the storyline. Just, right? <laughs> just heads up about yeah. this. Uh, but absolutely awful that we follow it up with he's, of course been sexually harassing his PA, Bonnie, at the same time, and they turn it into bullying all around. So no winners here, no heroes. Pretty bad all around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then we got the leak storyline. A -tra Sage definitely knows that A-Trade is the leak, but ultimately, due to Ashley getting yeah, dumped Ashley. by Catherine Coleman, she clearly manipulates his texts to make it look like he's been texting M.M. and he's beaten to death in the uh, Seven conference room. Uh, surprising end for Cameron Coleman. I can't believe that happened. Yeah. Bummer, man. We have a great run on The Voice. Longer than most, but could have been more. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that was very interesting. I do think we're not done with the leak storyline. There was also an interesting moment at the end where Tech Knight and Sage are hanging out and she's showing him his notebook. And first of all, I was like, oh, having the two smartest people get together. I thought that was very interesting. But he's like, oh, fuck, is that what you're really doing? So it feels like whatever plan she has is so much worse than we know at this point. Yeah. Yeah, we're starting to get A Train's onto her a little bit, it seems like. So I don't know. It, it feels like, in the same way, she's onto him. So I don't know. That That's. An, I'm ex very intrigued by what's going on there. She's She could go any which way. It's also really, you know, from where A Train started to the fact that we're rooting for A Train to be the good kind of person on this evil team is very interesting. Yeah. He's yeah. the only one that has even any hint of morality at this point. So, yeah, we want to not positively exploit that and see that come out further. Um, anything else? There's obviously a lot else that's happening in the episode. Um, I'll mention the line, the deep says, some say go woke, go broke. We say go woke, get yoked. Great. <laughs> Another great joke. Silly line. Uh, uh, on the awful racism stuff, uh, Homelander telling Ryan it's like being a slave, only worse. Oh, oh yeah. Jesus. Oh, my God. Uh, what else? What else? The um, I would I just want to say the way that they dress Ashley, that well, Ashley's wardrobe this season is so funny and good. Like, mm -hmm. it's she's such like she's not in a ton of the, the episode, but she is important, and they're just letting her be insane <laughs> the entire time. Yeah. Oh, one great. thing we should talk about Frenchie turns himself into the police for multiple murders. Oh. What do you think is going to happen there? Not great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder if they're going to have to bust him out or what's going to happen. But yeah, yeah that was a, it was just heartbreaking. The Kamiko and Frenchie fallout that's happening here. And um, yeah, it's just uh, it's really tough, tough to watch, man, because, you know, they need to sit down and talk to each other. And it's just uh, not happening at all. It's driving me crazy. Yeah. But the uh, Eminem fit check is uh, glorious. You know, he's got big pun going on there. It's just the, it's it's just, just glorious. Excellent. Yeah. Well, speaking of best things in the episode, why don't we wrap up here by talking about who is best boy? Pete, who is your best boy in the episode? Uh, you got to, I got to go with Huey. Uh, you know, I mean, Good call. Uh, that was just, uh, he made a lot of smart moves and, uh, you know, did the right thing. And uh, it was really funny, uh, you know, his mom was freaking out and he was very calm. And he was like, well, you know, I've been through a lot of this at this point. So you know, <laughs> this is just a Tuesday. Yeah, I agree. That was great, um, though. I'm going to give it to Ryan. Uh, I really Whoa. it's hard from a from you're a performance pulling for him point. to turn evil is what you're happy about. What's going on with Ryan? I'm just saying story-wise, I thought it was surprising. And Ryan has been sort of this floundering, like, potential hero and pawn for everyone. And the fact that we saw him turn here, and from a performance perspective, I thought uh, the guy who plays Ryan, it's hard to play, like, a floundering, you know, preteen. Voice-cracking preteen, but yeah. He's, he's been doing, doing well. that. 
he's yeah. been doing that well and then he snapped into sort of evil mode in a way i was like oh damn that was really well done so i i'm gonna go with ryan and I'll mention Jacob Tremblay did a great job of that in the recent live action Little Mermaid where he played Flounder. <laughs> wow. 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 So he was Good best pull. boy in that movie. Wow. Anyway, uh, I will give it up to Eb Eb, like I said earlier, just him getting the whole team together. Hives. And hives. I love hives. I love hives. I wish I had them. Maybe I'll get what? them when I go for farm, farm death. I guess we'll see what Don't happens. Don't wish that, my friend. Uh, a wish for hives. A new movie from Disney. <laughs> if you want to support this podcast and all the podcasts, we do patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Facebook and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about the boys. Apple, Spotify, Android, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at comic book live on Twitter slash X, comic book club live on TikTok and Instagram, comic book club live.com for this podcast and many more. Until next time, boys, we're waiting to hear from you. Oh, wow. And remember, these three men are in perfect condition to fuck a sheep. <laughs> Signing off. <laughs> no.